Good evening. During this Jubilee Year of Mercy, the National Shrine has been hosting a monthly lecture series focusing on the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Our Holy Father Pope Francis tells us that it is his burning desire that the Christian people reflect on the corporal and spiritual works of mercy as the mystery of mercy is the bridge which connects God and humanity. Tonight, we are happy to have with us Sister Carol Keehan. Sister Carol is a daughter of charity and the ninth president and chief executive officer of the Catholic Health Association of the United States. The Catholic Health Association advances the Catholic health ministry of the United States in caring for people and communities. Comprised of more than 600 hospitals and 1,400 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states, the Catholic Health Ministry is the largest group of nonprofit health care providers in the nation. Through the Catholic Health Association, the health care ministry raises a collective passion for compassionate care. Sister Carol has held influential roles in the governance of a variety of health care, insurance, and educational organizations. In addition, she has been a member of several health, labor, and domestic policy committees of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and serves on the Finance Committee for the Archdiocese of Washington. I met Sister Carol many years ago when I did not have gray hair and had more of it, and she was president of Providence Hospital here in Northeast Washington. It was Sister Carol who truly turned around Providence Hospital. It was in a bad state. She brought it back to life. And because she is a genius in many ways, she managed to turn a profit for the hospital while also making sure the hospital took care of the poor who came to Providence in need. I consider myself quite fortunate to have Sister Carol among my friends. Please welcome Sister Carol Keehan, who will speak to us tonight on the topic, being agents of God's mercy to the sick. First, let me apologize for my scratchy voice. I think Washington's beautiful spring pollen has caught up with me, but I am really delight delighted to be here and grateful to you for being with us. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to celebrate a whole year of mercy, to be reminded every day that the constant mercy of God surrounds us and is there for each one of us in a personal way. That is a great grace. Our Holy Father has given the church a wonderful gift in emphasizing and repeatedly explaining the true nature of this great gift of God. We will never know how many people who felt alienated, judged unworthy or unwanted, will embrace the love of God and realize that God has always been there for them, loving and caring about them. I am sure that that is reflected every day in the confessional ministry of this great shrine. It, there will be people who have felt that way, who now know that their lives, their shortcomings, their real sins have never weakened God's love or desire to have a relationship with them. What a profoundly important truth for the church to put front and center. Pope Francis even says, the name of God is mercy. We have the joy of deepening our faith in a very special way this year. Tonight we heard in the gospel, Jesus respond to some Jews who demanded clarity about who he was. Jesus said, I told you and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify to me. And that brings us to ask as individuals and as a church, 
what do the works we do in the Father's name testify about us or about the church? Pope Francis responds clearly to this in his papal bull announcing the year of mercy. He says, mercy is the very foundation of the church's life. All her pastoral activity should be caught up in the tenderness she makes present to believers. Nothing in her preaching and in her witness to the world can be lacking in mercy. The church's very credibility in seeing how she shows merciful and is seeing how she shows merciful and credible love. The genius of this Pope is that he can be so profound and poetic and then bring it down to real life and the suffering of people. I've been asked to focus a bit on revealing God's love and mercy to the sick. So what I want to share first is a bit about what Pope Francis says of the sick and their place and their claim on us in the church. He starts with, indeed, how else, <clears throat> excuse me, could we be followers of the Lord if we do not personally engage in ministry to the sick. That's a big, big affirmation for those of us in healthcare. In, in ministry to the poor, the dying, the destitute, our faith in Christ, born of having recognized our own need for him, who has come to heal our wounds, to enrich us, to give us life, to nourish us, is the basis of our concern for the integral development of society's most neglected members. And he continues, I thank you for being close to those who are ill and all the suffering, offering them the loving presence of the shepherd. Talk about being agents of mercy. He went on to say, the gospel of the healing of the leopard, leper tells us today that if we want to be true disciples of Jesus, we are called to become united to him, instruments of his merciful love, overcoming every kind of marginalization in order to be imitators of Christ in the face of a poor or sick person. We must not be afraid to look him in the eye and to draw near with tenderness and compassion, to touch him and embrace him. I have often asked this of people who help others, to do so by looking them in the eye, not to be afraid to touch them, that this gesture may help also be a gesture of communication. We too need to be welcomed by them, a gesture of tenderness, a gesture of compassion. In the, again, in the bull of the extraordinary jubilee of mercy, the Pope noted, at times we are called to gaze even more attentively on mercy so that we may become a more effective sign of the Father's action in our lives. God's love is meant to reach out to each and every person, those who welcome the Father's embrace for their part become so many other open arms and embraces, enabling every person to feel loved like a child and at home as part of one human family. God's fatherly care extends to everyone like the care of a shepherd for his flock, but is particularly concerned for the needs of those sheep who are wounded, weary, weary, or ill. Jesus told us that the Father stoops to help those overcome by physical or moral poverty, the more serious their condition, 
the more powerfully his divine mercy is revealed. Let's go back <clears throat> to Pope Francis when he talked about the gospel of the leper who comes to Jesus and says, <clears throat> if you want to, you can heal me. There are different translations of Jesus' response, but the one I like best is the one that's trans that translates Jesus' response by saying, <clears throat> of course I want to be healed. That, I think, is what the Pope is talking about when he talked about being called at times to gaze even more attentively on mercy. When he points this out, when he points out that when people are suffering, whether it's from a serious problem or an illness, that they feel the special love and care of those around them that reflects God the Father's care for them. Oftentimes, when I talk about this gospel of the leper, people look at me and say, yeah, sister, that's really great, but don't look to me to imitate Jesus. I'm not very good with leprosy. And he could just say, yeah, be cured, and they're cured. <clears throat> and that's true. Most of us are not that good with leprosy. But that does not let us off the hook. It can't be an excuse for wimping out on our responsibility to the sick, the elderly, the disabled, and the vulnerable. There are many things that afflict them that if we had the same response of Jesus, we could cure instantly. I think so often of the elderly people who come into our clinics, our emergency rooms, or who are in our nursing homes. And they come in and they know they're more challenging to care for than the 30-year-olds who jump up on the exam table. They, we see so often in their eyes a sense of, I know I'm a burden. I know most people think I'm useless to the world. I even feel useless to the world. I know I don't matter anymore. And yet, I know that I feel so unwanted and unvalued. And frankly, we have to look at these people as they come to us as though they are looking at us and saying, if you want to, you can cure me of feeling so unimportant, so valueless, so unaccepted, and so unloved. If you want to, you can cure me of this. And really, this is as ugly as leprosy. So, no wimping out. We have to do everything we can to respond with, of course I want to be, to be cured. And I have seen hundreds and hundreds of instances where an elderly person has come in in this state, very, very stressed, upset, and feeling like everybody sees me as useless and a burden. And yet you see a caregiver come into them, talk with them, say, oh, hello. So good to see you. You're Mrs. So-and-so. Oh, come right in. Let's get started see what we can do to help. And pretty soon, they're talking about, I love the color of your blouse. And the next thing you know, that person who was so upset, so stressed, feeling so worthless, has a sense, she thinks I'm important. She thinks I'm worth fixing. She thinks I'm worth checking on. It makes all the difference in the world. And I see it in our nursing homes. And you say, someone is coming in, and it's the third time in two hours we've changed the bed. And instead of saying, you again, 
the person says, oh, you got a chance. Now we have a chance to finish that story. And totally takes her mind off of the, off of the bed that needs to be changed, gets it changed by having a wonderful conversation. That is the tender mercy of God at its best with the poor and the vulnerable and the elderly. And it really does cure when people know if someone comes in and I have a problem or I'm not in such a good state, they will take care of me and they will love me. So that is a very important thing for us to think about when we talk about the, the mercy of God to the elderly. It's also important that we remember that yes, hospital and nursing home staffers have to do this, but we in our homes, in our neighborhoods, with our friends, with the woman that lives next door, need to do the same things. We can make people feel so valuable in our families and in our neighborhoods that they never develop that sense. Or if they had it, we've wiped it away. Do we make people pay attention to every spill they make at a meal? Do we wince and groan every time they need to be helped up to get to the bathroom, even though they were just there a couple minutes ago? Do we get irritated when it takes them so long to get up out of the chair, they forgot their purse, they forgot their cushion. No. Those are the tender mercies of God to the elderly. And we are all called to be those agents of tender mercy. Making people feel as loved as God loves them is a great opportunity and a great gift to share. And it is so important that we do this in our families as well as in our workplace. The Holy Father has a great gift to talk about this in, in the way a good shepherd would treat them. And he talks about we need to treat people about the same way the, the good shepherd would, the way our Lord would. And it is not in a way of looking at people with the eyes of what more do you want? What else is the problem? It is taking the look of people who, I love you. You are very important. And so we stop and we say, yes, you are very important. And I show it by the fact that I'm interested that I'm not complaining about your frailties, that I'm, not, that I'm not irritated with how long it takes you. Those are the important opportunities we have. Um, we also have this opportunity in another area with the sick that is so critically important in our country today, and that is with people who are seeking assisted suicide and are seeking assisted suicide because they are depressed, because they feel worthless, because they have been made to feel like a burden, you're just hanging on, or they feel so frightened that they will die lonely, tied up to machines without anyone to care for them. And it has really, unfortunately, given life to an assisted suicide and our tenderness, our care, is the one and only best defense against people feeling they need to resort to suicide. People who feel everyone would be better off and happier if I died and everyone could get on with life are really suffering greatly. People who feel that their dignity, that they'll wallow in a bed unclean, that they will have machines and, and um, IVs and things like that put on them because they'll not, they won't be respected in what they want. 
that they'll die lonely and afraid and without any spiritual or emotional support and probably in pain, those people look quickly to suicide. Our efforts with the very ill and with the dying are the things that will keep people living until God calls them. They, they will keep people paying attention to the fact that you are loved and every miniature here is a grace for each of us. And we are privileged to have you. I don't know how many of you saw Vicki Kennedy, Senator Kennedy's wife, who spoke, who did an editorial the day before the vote on assisted suicide in Massachusetts. And everyone believes she turned the tide. She talked about how wonderful it was to have her husband for one more day, one more hug, one more kiss, one more tear together, one more laugh, one more prayer together, and how much that meant. You know, we have to make sure everyone has that same experience. And so whether we're an official caregiver in the hospital or hospice, a family caregiver, a friend, neighbor, a member of the family, we can all contribute by creating this by way of by the way we interact with those who are dying, by the support we give them with our prayers <clears throat> and our prayers with them, by sharing a joke, sharing a memory, sharing something that was so impressive about them. All of these things help so much the person who is sick. They help the dying realize people love me, people will miss me, People want me for as long as they can have me. And it doesn't in any way force us to do long, uh, prolonged deaths by any means, keeping people alive no matter how much discomfort there is and using all kinds of extraordinary measures. No way. It simply means letting people know, go when God calls you. And until then, we are so happy you're here. And we will be there for you when you're in pain, when you're frightened, when you need emotional and spiritual support. And we will be there just to laugh with you and to hug you. You are loved. That is the one thing that when you study suicides in, in uh, countries that have had it for a long time, assisted suicide, most of the people are doing it are, are just so depressed and feel they have nothing left. We can be that agent of mercy. And so I would say the last group I want to talk quickly about is the poor when they are sick, because they not only often have to get, go after where to get care, but then how to pay for it. They are often, as St. Vincent de Paul would call them, the bashful poor. When they are sick, they need extra mercy and love to assure them that just because you don't have a lot of money, you are still welcome and you are still as important as every other patient that I have. And, and that is a, a very great gift that um, we are able to give when we reach out to poor, whether it's in our parish, our clinics, <clears throat> in our neighborhood, um, with the Ladies of Charity, the Vincent de Paul Society, we must be there and we must be careful because very often they are so bashful, they suffer and we could, we could relieve it. So I would say, <clears throat> to close, Pope Francis says, <clears throat> among our tasks as witnesses to the love of Christ is that of giving a voice, God help me, I wish he would give me one, <laughs> is that of giving a voice to the cry of the poor so that they are not abandoned to the laws of an economy that seems at times to treat people as mere consumers. We have the great opportunity to be the agent of God's mercy to people every day. And in this year of mercy, my prayer for each of us is that we will 
respond to that opportunity and that we will each grow in the mercy of God so that we can be more of the mercy of God to the people that we come in contact with. Thank you so very much. Thank you.